I know a lot of us watched it live and um, the last race of that 2020 worlds um, was obviously for which American team was going, uh, was going to the Olympics and it was incredible and exciting. And if you guys could just take us through um, what happened in that race, including your mindset and then just, I don't know, the story, I guess. Well, I'll start. And I actually, cause I wanted to say one more thing earlier that I want to say real quickly and it's sort of relevant that um, the lake, the generosity of the Lake Buell community has allowed Steph and I to compete all over the world. And we never would have gotten to this point without you guys. And when we say that you guys were there on that race course with us, like we really mean it. Like going into that last race with the regatta, we had to believe in ourselves and say to ourselves, okay, we have to go win this race. And that's not something we usually say, you know, that'd be a little crazy if every race of every regatta, we're like, we have to win, we have to win, we have to win, you know? Um, but that race, we did literally have to win in order to finish third overall and to go on to the Olympics. And so um, we had to believe in ourselves. And there were a lot of moments that like looking at the scoreboard when we weren't winning the trials or, you know, in a leading position, it, we think back to those conversations that we've had with like, whether it's you guys or our family or, um, other sailors in the community, but like those, t those moments that people just tell us that they believe in us and that they're still behind us means so much to us and really helped me dig deep that day and believe in myself. I mean, whether it was the notes from Candace Porter, you know, saying, go, 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 you guys, you got this and we love you, you know, or people liking our stuff on Facebook or cheering from afar, like that meant so much to us and helped us really believe in ourselves and believe we could, you know, overcome this and believe that we could do it in the end. And yeah, I just, I just wanted to make that little point before we get into the nitty gritty details. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't echo that enough, that's for sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, reliving, re, yeah, replaying that race in my head. Um, I mean, I've, I've thought about it a lot, obviously. <laughs> um, I think, I just think that we had a very process oriented approach. Um, we really just put all of our energy into focusing on the steps and not thinking about what could happen or what the results could be or any of that stuff. We just put all of our energy into, okay, what do we need to do next? And what do we do, need to do after that? And that was like on shore because we had a really kind of awkward gap between the two fleet races in the morning and then um, the metal race in the afternoon. So it was like, okay, we came to shore, we had changed out of our wetsuits, we tried to chill, we ate food, we, you know, did our measurement checks, and then we came back out for racing. And we were the first ones off the beach by, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. And we just wanted to get out there and start chomping at the bit to start doing our pre-race homework to tick off as many boxes as we could before that race. And, you know, like Maggie said, it was a must win for us. And we just wanted to feel as prepared as we could be. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that race is a lot about mindset and just trusting that it wasn't over until it was over and fighting for every single inch and trusting all the training that we had put in into that point. You know, it's like we train and train and train and train. And then we had a perfect bear away and a beautiful hoist by Maggie where we were able to set up for a really good downwind and, and hold them out from driving. So I think that yeah, I think we were just really trusting all the hours that we put in on the water. Yeah, and, and there were times that, like, right, okay, we, like Steph said, we got up to the race course, and then there was this weird pause, and the breeze was building, and we were admittedly not the fastest in big breeze in that, you know, in that condition, in that fleet, especially. And so I think the nerves were kind of building up as we were waiting for the, our start. Um, but we, we just kept going upwind and, like, going through our same checklists and our process, and anytime we got nervous, like we would either say it out loud or just, you know, focus on the next little task we had to concentrate on. I think that's what really allowed us to continue thinking clearly. Like even when we just, you know, even when the suspense was like uh, potentially overwhelming, it just like allowed us to keep putting one foot in front of another. Um, and even just saying to each other, just focus on the process, focus on the process. Um, but we got out there and they finally started our race after what felt like, you know, two hours and it was really like 20 minutes or something. They started our race, we nailed the start, and we talked about that, you know, positively, like, we have to nail the start, let's go nail the start, let's work on this, let's do a few accelerations, practices, um, and then we nailed the start, we were so happy with it, and thought we were in a great position, we were confident that other boats were over the line early, the X flag went up on the committee boat, 
And then all of a sudden, like multiple boats were turning back. So there was this like mass confusion and I was being really stubborn and Steph was like, I think I see a general flag. And there was confusion. One Mark set boat put a general flag up. The race spin boat had an X flag up. Um, but I, I kept being like, no, no, everyone was wrong. Everyone's wrong. No, we're right. We have to keep sailing. Like I was so stubborn about it. And so Steph entertained me and we made it like almost a winner mark before they flew a abandonment flag and we had to go back down. Um, and I think that would have been a really easy moment for Steph to kind of like get frustrated or upset or get nervous, you know, as the skipper like, oh my gosh, can we go do it again? But instead she just pretended like nothing happened. And like we were starting fresh and clean. And um, yeah, that was totally cool. And uh, there were moments too that like, we talked about needing to needing to like be brave and take risks, you know, and like I, my job is to manage the, t the distance, the starting lines. And I felt like, okay, the way I can be brave is to like tell Steph confidently to pull the trigger, you know, and, and then we send it and we don't second guess it. Um, and then there were times that I was so exhausted, like we almost capsized at the Lord Mark and maybe Steph can walk us through that situation. But I was so exhausted. And in those moments when you almost capsize in the middle of a race, like you pull harder on anything that you've ever pulled before. Like you find this like strength inside you that like you think you're, you're going to like rip the trapeze out of the mast, you know? And like, it was, it's so exhausting, like physically and emotionally. And um, after that lured mark rounding, which felt like 10 minutes and then watching the video, it was like 10 seconds or less. Uh, I remember saying to Steph, like, I'm totally dead. You know, you got to look around. I got nothing, you know? And that felt nice too, because I was like so fully relying on my teammate and just being like, Hey, <laughs> I got nothing. I need to catch my breath, you know, and uh, you're on everything right now. And, and she was, and uh, I felt really lucky to have a teammate that I could lean on like that in those moments. Oh, <laughs> oh. yeah. Steph, can you take us through and Maggie too, but can you take us through that last lured mark where it looked like you guys really made the, the big move? <laughs> I wish I could say it was a planned move, but <laughs> um, it got a little crazy. Um, like I said earlier, we, we had a really good bear way um, where we were able to like soak down inside of them and be like pretty much just clear behind and then like a half a boat length to a boat length to leeward of them. So as we got out towards the right hand side of the course, looking downwind, we were in control of the jive point. Um, and as we got closer and closer to the ley line, they started um, slowing down. So they just like oversheeted their spinnaker so that we would run into them. So right as we saw that happening, we started to jive. They matched the jive. And then we were both, I think there, there was a bit of a right shift and more pressure and we were overstood even with the square course. So we started coming back in a huge puff. Um, we were, we rolled them, we're clear ahead. Um, and then just like really on our ear coming all the way back to the, to the gates. Um, and as we were coming back to the gates, the Germans who were in third started heading towards the right hand turn mark. I'm trying to do like sailing karate here so they started turn, going to the right hand turn we had to duck them which is like hard enough in like 12 knots of breeze in one of these boats let alone like 20 knots of breeze so we ducked them and then like I, I don't know how that happened but we we just like totally dug the wing in the water and, and nearly capsized so I think Maggie was already in trying to trying to take the kite down and I was sailing a really high angle to the left turn mark. So she was trying to take the kite down and then we maybe got hit with a bigger puff. I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden Maggie was like full Tarzan mode, just like hanging on the trapeze as hard as she could to try to save us from capsizing. And I remember in that moment just thinking, we, we cannot capsize here. This is, this is race over if we capsize. So we were just putting like all of our energy into saving the boat. And pretty much at that exact moment, Paris and Anna, the other American team, sailed in from behind, overlapped us quite closely to windward and their spinnaker hit me. Um, and we were in the zone for the left-hand turn. So we hailed protests and I was like super proud of myself. I did like everything very formal, like got the protest flag out of my life jacket, found the umpires, made eye contact with them. And then with the whole like contact patting on the head thing. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we were we were a total mess after that lured mark. I didn't have the main sheet in my hand, so we went to turn the lured mark, and I'm like stuck out on the trap wire. Maggie's still getting the kite down. There's no main sheet, so the boat's just like totally healed to windward and stopped. And then Maggie just yeah, she found, she got the main sheet in, and we got going again. And yeah, that's that was it. It was um, cool too because there was so much chaos that we, that we didn't see at all. Like we were so focused on what we were doing and the fact that they were spinning, and then we knew we still had a couple boats to pass. Um, when we got into shore, and a, a bunch of sailors came over and congratulated us, they were all like, 
you have to watch the live stream. That Lord Mark was insane. Nobody sailed normal. Like it was just complete chaos. And then we watched the live stream and people are like weaving in and out of other boats and shrimping their kites and capsizing. We were like, what happened? Like that was nutty, but like, what, what is everyone doing? Yeah, it was kind of, it was amusing. <laughs> we missed out on a lot of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to miss out, I imagine. <laughs> Um, so with the Olympics being rescheduled, uh, for 2020, what does that mean for you guys? Do you have to re-qualify? Are they adding more regattas to 2020? What, uh, what exactly does that look like? I'm going to let Maggie take this question. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. We have no idea. <laughs> we, we keep planning different scenarios, you know, that involve how or how soon we can start training. Um, we assume we'll be able to travel domestically probably sooner, uh, in a safe manner before we can travel internationally. So, you know, a lot of our plans involve, okay, how, how soon can we get back to some big training blocks down in Miami? Um, we've heard of a lot of events being rescheduled for the fall or hoping to reschedule, but no one's really committing to anything at this point. So in our ideal case scenario, we start training in um, Miami and Long Beach this summer uh, where we've got two boats, basically. One is already in Miami and one is on its way to Long Beach. And then we are really hoping to do some European events in the fall if it's safe to do so and if the events get rescheduled. Um, and then the preliminary hopes that we've been hearing is that next spring schedule will be pretty standard and that's a, a European circuit of a few events. And then springtime, a lot of time in Japan. But this is all very hopeful. You know, we have dates for the Olympics in 2021, but nothing is confirmed and we even had a U.S. sailing team call today that they just said, you guys have to continue to be ready for anything. And maybe not, you know, maybe worst case scenario, not sailing till the fall. And so how do we control what we can control? And I loved what Luther said. He's like, you guys better end this block of time fitter than you started it. <laughs> and I was laughing. I was like, I don't have a, a dumbbell. I don't have a rowing machine. You know, like my 10 pound weights are only going so far, but we do. I'm kidding. You know, we, we will. We've been focusing on fitness in a different way, but he was very clear with the team. He's like, you better be fit. We better see a new kind of fitness out of all of you. And then he tells us about his puzzles and stuff. I'm like, so, yeah. um, that actually leads really well into my next question of uh, what are you doing and what can you do to keep improving during this time with all the stay at home orders in effect? And I imagine you guys can't get on the water. So how are you uh, keeping, keeping in shape and keeping uh, sharp? Yeah, that's definitely been a challenge. Um, like Maggie said, we're having to get a little creative with our workouts. Um, I was fortunate enough to snag some weights um, from my local gym. So I have a set of dumbbells, a kettlebell, and a medicine ball. And um, my road bike is basically keeping me entertained. And we're lucky we work with um, a trainer. His name's Mike Kushner. Some of you might know him from um, Lake Minnetonka. But he has a business called Sailing Performance Training, and he does all remote coaching with us. So it's not like a totally new concept for us to have, you know, to be training on our own and doing remote stuff. It's just, yeah, we don't have the weights that we would like. And, um, but yeah, we're just trying to step that whole program up. We're, we're on the weight gain. Um, <laughs> some of the teams who are sailing in the front of the fleet are sailing the boats quite heavy. So we have probably another ideally five kilos to gain before the next before the games so we're on, we're on the quarantine 15 program right now. <laughs> um but yeah i think for me i'm just doing a lot of like long bike rides and workouts and um we also have some webinars with the u.s sailing team where we're um we did some nice weather seminars we did um so a nice tactics talk with um a couple of previous olympians um and that's been really cool David, I think we, sh we should let you jump in with any of the chat questions that you've got. Uh, <clears throat> so we don't have any questions coming in from there. Uh, I did have a question. I have to think about what, what it was. Um, where are your boats at this point? <laughs> what do you have and where are they? They're at sea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, we had a... The, the boat, we had two boats down in Australia, um, just for the trials, we wanted to make sure we had two boats ready to go. And so those boats were supposed to be shipped from Australia to Japan for our Japan training starting in May, but they've been rerouted to Long Beach. So we have two boats in Long Beach, um, and then we have a boat in Europe, and then we actually just 
got our games boat, um, which was in Ooh. Italy and <laughs> was supposed, we were, it was supposed to go into a container in Palma and then get shipped from Palma to Japan. Um, and like, basically as Italy was about to shut down its borders, the people who were, um, where we bought the boat from, they were like, we need to get this on a truck tomorrow to get to Barcelona in order to make it there in time to get to the, the, um, the container. So it like got shipped out right away and then got to Barcelona and then Palma shut down their borders. So our games boat is, <laughs> is stuck in <laughs> Barcelona, but the good, we were very nervous about that because at that time we didn't have the news that the games was delayed. So we were pretty, we were like, you know, we don't have a games boat. How are we going to get a boat for the games? But now it's all delayed. So it's all good. <laughs> Okay, Dave, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, one, one is uh, from the chat uh, from uh, Mr. Dave Schultz, who Steph and Maggie may not know, but he's a, a brand new MC sailor, a fairly new MC sailor. Awesome. And he, and he loves it. But his question is, when racing, tell us something that makes you smile. <laughs> hmm. I would say when we just when we have those moments or when we just have like really good teamwork on the boat. Um, I think the boat is just so hard to sail and it's such an unstable platform that it just requires really good teamwork and com communication between us. And when we just, when we nail our maneuvers or nail bear away, like it's, it's an awesome feeling that I really love. Um, Mine was a little different. I mean, that makes me smile too, but usually I'm pretty exhausted when our boat handling is good. So <laughs> it's not like a moment that I'm like, oh, yay, good job. You know, I'm like, I need some water finally. Um, but what does make me smile is thinking about my grandpa. Uh, and, and on like a lot of tough days, I like to think about him because I started sailing with him on his big boat when I was younger up here in Michigan, actually. Um, and one thing that makes me laugh, one quick story about him is that he uh, at one point held the number of, uh, like he held the record for competing in the Chicago to Mackinac races like 64 times or something. Well, he didn't win it until his 64th time. And so it always makes me chuckle to think that he did something 63 times before succeeding. And then I hope that I also won't have to do it 63 times before we get our medal. Um, but it, that always kind of makes me smile that, he, you know, he really taught me like, if you love something, you just keep doing it. And you do it because you love it and winning is obviously the goal, but you can still love it and enjoy being in it and participating even if you're not winning every time. And so, yeah, this was technically my fourth shot at the Olympic trials because I competed in eight, 12 with Steph, uh, 16 with four other skippers and now 20 with Steph. And so, yeah, fourth time was a charm and I'm, I'm glad that wasn't 64, but I, I do feel very lucky to have that sweet memory of him. And, and I think about him a lot on tough days on the water. Cool, thank you. And then from Christine, have you ladies developed any superstitions over the course of this campaign? Special, special outfits, meals, whatever? Hmm. We have some traditions. I wouldn't say that they're hard and fast superstitions, but um, <laughs> yeah, so some weird things that we've recently been doing. Uh, Steph doesn't like to look at the scores during a regatta. And so that takes a lot of like discipline on her point, on her part, um, and also on mine, but it's a really successful little tradition that we started. <laughs> um, also, Steph buys me puzzles for big regattas. That's a nice one. And uh, I'm the puzzle master. So whoever gets to participate in the puzzle, everyone can do the puzzle, but I set the rules. So that's a little tradition. <laughs> Julia makes us some amazing pasta and we call it the Julia pasta. Yeah. And that's uh, when we have like either a really good or a bad day she'll cook for us, which is really nice. Um, I don't know what other, I don't think we do too many. Steph is so, so stubborn about having bananas on the boat. And last time I brought a banana on the boat, I put it in my penny and forgot I had it. And then when I climbed <laughs> into the boat to, for the start of the day, I have to, I have to wade in the water and hold the boat basically at my, at my belly button height. And then I climbed into it and basically smushed the banana all over my life jacket. So it looked like a little baby had like burped up. And Steph was like, that's what you get. That's, that's what you had coming. You know, you shouldn't bring that banana on the boat. I can't think of any other weird ones, though. <laughs> Isn't there something with the pants? Don't you have like special pants for certain days or something? Oh, we do have these um, wetsuit pants that are like 
this ridiculous floral pattern that Helly Hansen sent us and we call them our party pants. So yeah, yeah we'll, we'll bust those out every once in a while. They're for special occasions though. Totally. <laughs> All right. This one, this one's from Matt, the, the coach you don't remember stuff. Um, oh. <laughs> is, there, is there a team from another country that you love competing against? Uh, well, we've been training a lot with um, the Argentinian girls, and I, I love training with them. I love racing with them. They're just really great girls all around. Um, and I couldn't say that there's, like, one that we, like, especially love competing against. I can tell you I really like beating all of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> Maggie, you got any ideas? <laughs> no, I just thought Argentina was, yeah. we like to train against them. And, and um, you would think that if you sailed against just the same team for like two or three weeks, that you'd get sort of like bored of sailing against each other. And that couldn't be less true in this, in this circumstance. We can push each other so hard that we're still very competitive and exhausted by the end of it. Um, and then on days that we do feel like we're just going to lose our mind, then we start switching around and I'll sail with that skipper. We like to have this like full competition where we do every permutation of combinations and then decide who is the champion of all champions. And um, that is particularly fun for me because usually when I'm sitting with the other crew, Steph and the other skipper Vicky uh, capsize, which is just like so such sweet victory moment for us. But no, we have really good fun with them. That just happened once in Garda. Yeah. And we were, we were laughing because we crews had just had like a, it was our second session of the day. We were so exhausted. And then the skippers get in a boat together and like their first tack, they capsize. <laughs> we were like, now they appreciate us. <laughs> so, now we have good fun with them. Okay. Here's one for me. Uh, on your last chat at the St. Francis uh, Yacht Club, uh, you mentioned something about how you could work on something for six months before you really got it. And you, you implied that it was, you know, some fairly small things. Can you give us an example? I mean, six months seems like a, you know, a long time to, to make one little improvement. And maybe I don't have it right, but you got some examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the one specific skill set I was talking about on St. Francis call, which is really um, sharp in my mind about, is tacking. Um, we, I always used to do this, the... I would switch the main sheet. Like I've got the main sheet during the tack. So I used to always pull up, cross the middle of the boat, switch the main sheet and then grab my new trapeze with my new hand and then uh, go out and clip myself in. Um, and we figured that it was actually faster if I uh, switched the main sheet behind my back before crossing the boat. So it sounds like a pretty minor, just like timing change, but um, especially uh, in all different conditions it proved really hard to like unremember and rewrite this muscle pattern that I had gotten so used to for like four years. Um, and there was one day that I remember we were sailing upwind um, off Miami beach and I made us go upwind for like two and a half hours because I just was so stubborn and just wanted to get this down and I wasn't nailing it. And it wasn't really so much like trying to just switch the main sheet at a different time. It's also trying to manage the sheet tension throughout that whole process. And I got really frustrated with it and I felt like I was just banging my head against the wall. Um, and I actually, I, I remember we sailed upwind and then I was too exhausted to sail downwind. So our coach, uh, Willie at the time had to hop in and sail downwind with Steph. And I just like sat on the boat, made a PBJ and like was so dead tired. But, um, the, the point I was making is like that work was so hard and seemed tedious at the time and seemed like such a minor adjustment, but really hard to make. And then it was like six months later we were racing and I, and we were executing tax at like a really high percentage of the time. And the hand switch that had taken me so long to nail down finally became second nature. And um, that just really reminded me how gratifying that learning process is. Like the harder the concept is, the longer you struggle with it. And um, I understand that doesn't sound like a really hard concept, but physically it's pretty, it was, it is still pretty hard to do um, with the perfect timing. And so um, I, I do, that was like, part of the learning process that I love is just that like you struggle with it for a long time and then the gratification is really delayed and you might not see it for several months and you might not execute at a high level in racing context for a long time, but when it does happen and it clicks, it's like so rewarding. That's great. Steph, do you have any, anything like that as well? Um, I would just say like everything's kind of constantly evolving, you know, like we we're kind of always revisiting ideas and, 
just trying to find ways to do things better and better. And I, yeah, like the boat handling aspect of it all is a really good challenge for us. And, um, you know, you can watch like, you can watch how the guys sail the 49er and they are just like, they're next level. They're so fast across the boat and that's, you know, that's what we aim for. So I think, you know, really just, yeah, constantly pushing ourselves to become physically and phys physically better and better on the boat. I can give you an example, Steph, of uh, a concept that we wrestled with for a long time. And then we, when it started clicking, we were really, really, you were very satisfied. Remember our finish line plays that we yeah. sort of identified, we identified uh, this was a weakness or an area for improvement in Genoa, Italy. And uh, it was, yeah, our coach Julia is like not so subtle sometimes when she really wants us to work on something. And she very vocally and angrily, we lost a few boat line, we lost a few points right at the finish line for like the third time that day. And she was furious and like, it was light air and she just ripped over and tied us on the toe and like towed us in at Mach 8 and was so mad and angry. And we were like, we know we screwed up, you know? And then we talked through and everything and she wasn't mad on shore, but she's just very passionate. And when we do something over and over, she gets, she's like living it with us, you know? Um, but then uh, Steph, I would say that when it started clicking and, New Zealand, it was like really, you were super psyched. You were like making these plays that it had taken a long time to execute on the race course. And then when it all clicked, it was like such sweet satisfaction. Yeah. Good example. Great. Here's one, another one from Christine. With international travel being limited for a while, are there any stateside partners available when you do get to sail domestically again? Um. Yeah, we were lucky just when we did our recent training block here um, in March, beginning of March, we sailed with a younger FX team, um, a development team, and they were really great pushing us a lot with um, our speed and boat handling. Um, and there's a lot of teams on the um, development program right now who are, we hope to get involved um, this summer and fall and winter when we're back here in Miami. So yeah, there are. And um, we also were having conversations with um, Paris and Anna, our competitors, to um, to sail with us in Japan a little bit. Um, but obviously that's all been put on hold. So we'll see. You know, it kind of depends on when we can get back on the water and, um, you know, if they're still interested in joining us. It'd be awesome to have them out there with us. And just to clarify, Andrew asked a question earlier that I didn't think you specifically answered. But uh, there's no requalification. You guys are in, right? Um, we just had a phone call. I'm laughing because we just had a phone call about all this with the U.S. sailing team this afternoon. Um, and Maggie, correct me if I'm wrong on the grammar on all this, but um, it's the intention of the U.S. sailing team to submit the same roster to the U.S. OPC um, of the people who have already qualified. But now, basically, they have... Basically, they put a clause into our trials that everything is under review. Um, but again, the, the intention of the U.S. sailing team is to have the teams who have already qualified represent at the Olympics. So we're just waiting on final confirmation from the U.S. OPC on that. Um, is there anything to add to that, Maggie? No, I, oh, just one little clarification. The reason, they, the reason the whole document of the selection pr pr criteria is under review um, is that several of the events haven't been completed you know the 470 worlds couldn't happen Finn worlds couldn't happen palma couldn't happen and so that's sort of how they cover all their bases by just saying hey this whole selection criteria is now under review but we've been told they have no intention of reopening our trials you know and we've we have won our trials um but they have not yet announced team usa so that's what that's like the funny limbo that we're in but we've been told that we don't need to worry that, you know they don't they understand it would be a logistical nightmare of, you know, fairness nightmare, <laughs> financial nightmare to have to do a whole resale of trials at this point when we don't even know when we're going to get on the water again. So. So we don't have any youth on this call, but. Um, what, <laughs> well, what are you talking about? That's <laughs> fired. Real youth, real youth. <laughs> uh, but two questions on that. What, what stands out? In, in, in your memory as most important to your development in sailing as a, as a youngster? And secondly, what advice would you give to our youth that, that kind of want to be like Steph and Maggie? <laughs> um, I think the thing that's, that stands out to me the most from my youth sailing was 
the environment that we had with the sailing school at Lake Beulah. I think it was just an awesome environment to fall in love with being on the water and um, surrounded by friends who are like your family. And um, I just thought that was really cool. And it inspired me to, to keep wanting to sail. And um, yeah, I think that was a really cool aspect of it all. And something I, I remember a lot is um, I won my first race when Katie Porter and I were sailing an Opti together. And I was like, Ooh, I think we went to Lauber's after that with Mr. and Mrs. Porter. Um, and I, I just remember like, Oh, this is a really cool feeling of winning. And I think that's like what, you know, I want, why I wanted to keep racing and keep going is I like the challenge of it all. But I think like, you know, at the beginning of the day, it was like the Beulah fun regatta where we were just like having so much fun on the water was, you know, what really, yeah, what, why I fell in love with being on the water. And I think that whole environment is super important. Maggie? Um, I would say, well, I'll start with my advice to youth sailors would be, um, one, I'm going to steal from Steph that I heard her mention last week that I think is great, uh, to sail as many different kind of boats as possible. Um, Steph and I both are really lucky to have sailed uh, so many slow boats, fast boats, heavy boats, lightweight boats. Um, we've raced in so many different fleets and that sort of like diverse experience um, has given us a lot of uh it's just given us a nice like uh, we feel like our quiver is really full you know we have a lot of um different ways of attacking problems we've also been exposed to a lot of different teams that are very professional and how they campaign or very unprofessional in how they campaign you know and so we have like learned a lot of lessons and learned a lot of what not to do um by sailing with different people on different boats and so i think that can only enhance your skill set and i highly recommend it i would say especially at a youth level do not think you need to specialize in any one boat right now um and then my second point to the youth sailors is is how i feel really strongly about this that the results really don't matter until they actually matter you know and for us they mattered at the olympic trials but they didn't matter before then you know um they you should be proud of your results you should cherish your results but you can't live and die by them you know when you move from sphere to sphere in sailing whether it be junior sailing to high school sailing, to college sailing, maybe professional sailing, maybe Olympic sailing, the results from your previous sphere, you know, those are accomplishments. You should be proud of them, but they don't make or break what you can accomplish in your next stage of life. And so I think it's really important to keep results in perspective. Um, and I'd offer a really, uh, yeah, I mean, the only data point I have to offer is that I got last place at plenty of regattas when I started out. Steph was like, you know, I, I met, I, I learned who Steph Robel was and she was like this totally fierce um, opti sailor who was like cleaning up all these titles and had run basically in like a professional opti campaign with Annie and team, um, I'm, I'm blanking right now. Most. Most. Come on. most, yes, it was most. Yes, I mean, everyone on that Never heard of so, it. Yeah, so competitive. They were so driven and, I, and it's sort of, I was totally intimidated by this like powerhouse that was coming from like, Lake Beulah, you know, um, I learned to sail on like butterflies and like had fun, like tipping them over and swimming under them with my cousins. You know, I've actually been going to my parents' cottage and finding all these like participation awards and I was getting like 17th and they gave me a medal for that. You know, I don't know if they do that in Beulah, but <laughs> we, you know, I was not on nearly as competitive a program. Um, and so what I've, I'm, this whole long story is that Steph and I had really different beginnings and our learning curves were at different times and different rates, but, um, the, the results that I failed to produce in the beginning of my sailing career has not affected how much I could learn in the end. The most important thing is that I fell in love with sailing. I fell in love with the process of improving. I fell in love with getting feedback from coaches and working on that. Um, and I think at an early stage, I did start to develop a growth mindset where you just want to absorb information and keep learning. And um, that's why I recommend you sailors do. Don't worry about the results. Just learn how to learn and fall in love with that process and you can do anything you set your mind to, you know, you, um, you know, and it's just what you do or don't produce in earlier stages of your sailing career are not going to influence and limit you in the later ones. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> that's inspiring. We should, we should clip that and put it right in front and center on the website. <laughs> um, Several coaches have commented on your, one of your strengths, which is to your, your ability to make mistakes and learn from them. Uh, can you speak about the dynamic on the boat when one of you makes a, makes a mistake? 
I think it, it, that goes off like what Maggie was just saying is embracing the growth mindset. And um, I think the other thing is really trusting that the other person's doing their job to the best of their abilities. Um, you know, the times that we start micromanaging, micromanaging each other, um, which is very tempting when one person has the main sheet and the other person has the tiller. It's, you know, there's a lot of feedback involved. And, um, you know, the days when I catch myself being like, east trim, east trim, it's like, we just start going so slow. So we just, we have a lot of trust in each other. And I think that, you know, we bring that into our learning relationship as well. Um, and just try to, you know, at the end of the day, we both know that our, our ultimate goal is to win a gold medal. And, you know, we don't really, there's going to be a tough road to get there. So sometimes you have days where you're going to, you have to give the other person some tough love or some days you have, you know, it's just, some days are harder than others. And um, it's just your, your openness and willing, willingness to learn from mistakes that um, I think help us bounce back. And I think we just have, we both have a really strong belief in that. And I think it's also a mentality that you have to actively cultivate and um, actively uh, like Steph was saying, we remind ourselves of it all the time, but also we have to be conscious of like how we set up our day. So one example I would give is that we got to worlds in Auckland, which was the first of the two events in our Olympic trials. And we got there and felt very much like, okay, we have put everything we could into this campaign. We've put as many hours as we physically could on the water we feel like we've done all we can and we're ready to go deliver and execute. Right. And that was sort of naive of us to think that we could um, just deliver and execute a performance and like the results will be what they will be. And I think it made us both feel very nervous. Like we just had to, we had to perform. Um, and so we, the, I felt that's how I felt at least the first couple of days of the regatta. And then we were not in a really great position after day two, we were actually in like 25th or something. It was terrible. And we had to say, okay, we need to reset. We need to focus on how high can we climb back from this, you know, and we need to dig deep. And um, I was so proud and impressed by Steph's like grit and just mental strength and determination to say like, I'm going to take every last point on this race course. We'll climb back up to 13th. And that was awesome. But I think the really big turning point was that we said, okay, we haven't delivered. Now we need to just learn as much as we can and keep improving. Um, and then we took that a step further at the second worlds in Australia and we said, well, we need to control some things in our team dynamic that, you know, we're making us feel like we just had to go perform. And we, we, we want to approach this regatta as a learning process and part of a bigger journey. Um, and so the ways we did that, we insisted on having a debrief every single day. Um, whereas at the first Worlds, we'd say sort of, okay, that was a bad race. The next one's going to be better. Let's just go out and do better. You know, um, we actually said, no, we want to like, we want to dig into the data. We want to dig into the learning moments. And that's going to make us feel like we can keep improving and keep moving forward and takes pressure off, like just delivering and performing. Um, and Steph and I'll have conversations where she'll be upset on the boat and mad at herself for making a mistake. And um, I remember one race at the second world's in between races, she got really bummed. And um, I tried to say out loud, like, Hey, it's okay. As long as you learn from that, you know, and as long as we don't make that mistake again, it's okay. There are a lot of races left and stuff. Like it was like a, it was like, boom, switch mentality completely onto the next race didn't think about the one before just took the lessons moved forward and, and ended on a really high note that day and I thought that was impressive and so I guess what I mean to say is like yeah having this growth mindset and saying mistakes are okay um is tough but it takes like it, it, it's you can't just one day decide that you're going to be okay making a lot of mistakes like you have to support each other making the mistakes and then you as a team need to set yourself up so that it's okay to fail you know sometimes I'll tell Steph and Julia that like I don't want any feedback for a couple minutes, you know, cause I'm just experimenting with how flat I can get the boat. I'm going to hit the water a couple of times. I'm totally going to screw up. I'm going to find that edge of it before I can come back and find the correct edge. And uh, you need to create that, like that a room to fail and experiment in order to learn. And, and sometimes it has to be done really consciously by telling everyone no yelling, no talking, no nothing. So mm -hmm. I'm sure you love that when I say that right stuff. I don't want any feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I get enough feedback when she's like gargling in the water, you know. <laughs> you said something a minute ago that um, really blew my mind. And I knew that you, Maggie has the main sheet and Steph has the tiller. How does that even work coordinating that? Because, you know, it, it's, a, it's a huge part of learning to sail the skiff. Um, yeah, coordinating all that. And, um, you know, we kind of just, 
we, when we first started sailing together, we like over communicated a lot. Um, and you know, which kind of mode I was sailing. So I'd be like, okay, I'm bow down building speed. And Maggie'd be like, okay, ease on the main. Okay. We're sneaking this up here. Main's kind of coming in and we're constantly resetting the apparent wind. Um, and just trying to keep the boat ripping through the water. Um, and then that kind of just evolved over time and we got more and more comfortable and feeling the same thing on the boat. And, you know, certain days there's more helm and more driving involved than others. And then you know, there's days when it's a really steady, um, sea breeze day. And that's just like Maggie playing a really smooth main sheet. And then if it's, you know, a high tempo day, like sailing on Lake Bulow where it's really puffy and shifty, it'd be a lot of, a lot of driving for me because the main sheet can't keep up, um, to balance the boat. So we talk a lot about that and how much we're going to, um, yeah, how much each is getting, getting played. And another cool thing that we've brought into our program is, um, this technology called true sail. Um, it's a telemetry system that we can mount on the boat, um, that gives us live feedback on the heel of the boat, the pitch of the boat, um, the amount of clue load on the, on the main. Um, and then we just bought a sensor that, um, can sense the amount of boom, of boom movement. So you can really see like, okay, how much main, sh how much main sheet Maggie's playing versus how much I'm steering. And we can really put numbers behind it with, you know, like our speed and our BMG and all that. So it's cool. We're taking it to the next level. It's really exciting. <laughs> wow. Okay. Candace has a question here. When did you learn the most in your sailing career? What events taught you the most? Was it college? Was it pro? Um, was it just all the time in the, in the 49er FX? I mean, where do you think your biggest ramp came? If that's, <laughs> if that's even possible to answer. Yeah, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think like junior sailing, I, I learned the most and just, yeah, like the, all the opti stuff and, you know, working as a team and, um, kind of the, the foundation for all of it when I was really young. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to think yeah, about it. <laughs> I, will, I will say for Steph, like you must have learned something. You must have gotten some serious work ethic from your junior sailing program because I've never ever sailed with someone that likes to train more than Steph does. <laughs> like we'll finish a day of training. Steph's like, oh, I just love practicing. I love training in this boat. And I'm like, I am so exhausted and ready to go to sleep, you know, and stuff's like, how many more hours can we stay out here? You know what I mean? And, uh, she like loves that process. So yeah, I, I would, I've always wondered, was that something you guys did at Beulah? Like, did you guys really have just so much fun during your practices that you were like, this is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's better at Beulah. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> nice so I have, a, I have a quick question for uh, Maggie. Um, I was listening to, you know, how you're coordinating going upwind. Do you ever feel really sorry for Steph after one of those days where there's just a little bit of helm and her wrist is getting really <laughs> Oh, yes. I feel so bad for her. I just say, well, why don't you go get the physical therapy instead of me? You know, your, your wrist must be really hurting. <laughs> no, and actually, Steph is pretty sweet. A lot of times after hard days, uh, Steph will offer to draw, uh, crew on the way in. Um, and it's sort of funny cause I don't, when I'm too tired, I don't trust myself driving the boat either. Like we'll try to jibe in 15 knots of breeze and Steph will turn around. And I've like dropped the main sheet. I'm crawling across the boat. I have like both tillers in my hand. Steph's like, what is happening back there? And I'm like, I'm too tired to do this either. Even like, I'd rather just, you know, um, but Steph is really sweet. She'll always offer to do that. <clears throat> um, but she doesn't complain. She'll never complain about anything. You know, I feel really bad. Like we're so close to each other on the boat. I do feel bad if I eat like a coffee flavored goo shot or something. And then she has to like <laughs> smell my coffee flavored breath or something, you know, for 20 minutes. Like we've been working on how can, you know, we sit so close together on the boat as it is. We're basically interlocked, especially downwind and breeze. And now we're figuring out like, how can we hang on to each other so that we're actually more secure in the boat and can hike harder. <laughs> and so we've been experimenting with some funny ways that she sort of nestles under my arm that's sheeting and then she holds my trapeze harness with one hand and our legs are totally intertwined and then she's she's like hooking her foot on my ankle to hike back further and so yeah that's when I really feel bad for you Steph if I've had some <laughs> bad flavored goo shots or something and you've got to smell that <laughs> breath <laughs> yeah I feel um, I feel pretty bad at times like if I 
if I screw up the bear away or capsize us on a jive or something, I just, anytime I didn't make Maggie's life a lot harder, I feel really bad about it. Yeah, but I will say every time we capsize, we've got a pretty good routine for that. And Steph always has to get in the water and take the kite down from yeah. in the water, which is <laughs> horrible. It's like hard enough to take it down when it's not full of water. And then Steph has to do it in the water full of water. <laughs> and so I, I kind of, I'm, I'm immediately not mad. I'm, I'm just like, oh, I get a little break on the board right now. <laughs> We actually, we had a funny practice, um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago here. It was really windy in Miami and like it was windier than we would have been racing in, but we were like, all right, let's go out and let's just, you know, bust out a couple of jives and a couple of tacks and just be out there in 30 knots of breeze. And we, we ended the day, we came into shore. I'm like, man, I'm really tired. And then I realized I did all the takedowns that day because we capsized every single time we tried to take the takedown. It was, it was like my favorite day of practice yet. Yeah, I was like, Dave, 25 knots, I didn't have to do a single takedown. It was great. <laughs> I did like six or seven takedowns that day. Well, um, we're coming up on the end of this. Um, before we go, I wanted to say two things. First of all, as Steph knows, I'm very adept at gaining weight. Um, so if you guys need any pointers, let me know. Um, midnight Taco Bell runs never hurt anybody. Ooh. Okay, good. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> um, and also, we were just kind of wondering um, the you know, give us an idea of the financial needs for your campaign, especially now that you're extending the training by a year. Um, yeah, as Maggie mentioned before, we we don't really know what our plans are long term, but we do know that we have you know. 15 more, 15, 16 more months until the games, um, which means, you know, that much time of training and traveling. And it, it depends based on if we're doing Europe or if we're just staying domestically. Um, but we do, you know, we, we pay for Julia, our coach. So that's a pretty big expense that we take on. Um, so yeah, it's, I would say anywhere between $75,000, a hundred thousand dollars, we need to fundraise, um, to make sure we're in good shape for the starting line for next year. 